welcome to this episode of DDB Talks, our video series featuring the brightest minds, most interesting stories and tales of unexpected works from around the world. I'm Lindsay Bennett and today I'm joined by Keith Reinhardt, Chairman Emeritus and Advertising Legend. Throughout his incredible career, Keith served as Chairman and CEO of DDB for 16 years, orchestrating the merger that created not only DDB, but also Omnicom, and created many famous campaigns that put us on the map. He's been called a soft-spoken visionary by Ad Age, one of the 100 most influential figures in the history of advertising and is a member of the Advertising Hall of Fame. It's a pleasure to have you, Keith. Now, this is going to be a two-part series, and we're going to go back to the beginning where it all began in 1986, when you were one of the architects of the industry's first three-way merger, forming what we know as Omnicom, but that you wanted to call Aardvark. How did DDB need him, as it was called then, come to be? Right. Well, it's, it was a more than a two-year process, almost three-year process, and uh, I had become um, I had become creative director of, a, of an agency called Needham Harper and Steers, and uh, Needham Harper and Steers was ranked number 16 in the world, and uh, the industry was going through a consolidation period with the Saatchi's uh, picking off uh, any number of agencies and collecting them. Uh, almost every week a new one. Uh, so we thought the consolidation was going to be uh, important for us. How can we go from number 16 to something more substantial when clients at that time were asking for global service? And the problem was one client would want uh, global service in these 16 countries and another would want client service in these 27 countries over here. So we began having some talks, but I uh, learned from my boss at that time, Paul Harper, that he was having some talks with Bill Burnback about maybe bringing these two agencies together because they were, uh, they were a match in terms of creative philosophy. And of course, as a copywriter, Bill Burnback was my idol as he was many other copywriters' idols. And uh, I would wait uh, for Life magazine to come out every week, and then I'd go through the magazine and tear out the Volkswagen ads and the Chivas Regal ads and the Avis ads and post them on my wall and say, that's the kind of advertising we should be doing. Um, the talks between uh, Paul Harper and Bill broke down. Uh, they couldn't uh, decide what to call a merged agency. Uh, Bill got distracted and then he became ill and uh, passed away in 1982. In 1984, Paul Harper named me to succeed him as chairman CEO of Needham Harper and Steers, which I promptly named Needham Harper Worldwide to give the impression that we were a global agency and we could serve clients in any market in the world. Um, and my idea was, can I pick up the dialogue between Paul and Bill and, and go to DDB and see if there isn't some way we can bring these two creative agencies together. So I uh, approached uh, the management of D Doyle Dane Burnback and they agreed to have breakfast with me, but they were absolutely buying none of this. I brought a, a huge map of the world and I had uh, little chips tacked uh, on each capital, advertising capital so that you could see what this thing would look like if we put the two together. And uh, one of the uh, senior managers at Doyle Dane almost choked on his bagel. He said, we want no part of this. But it, it was such a dream and such a good idea. Uh, so I enlisted the Allen Company, an investment firm, and I said, we'll buy Doyle Dane. And uh, that's how we'll put these th things together. I was so committed to this idea. Uh, the idea of building a global network on the insights of Bill Burnback. So um, anyway, uh, Alan Rosenshine was head of BBDO at the time, another copywriter turned CEO. And uh, I liked Alan. We began to have some, some breakfast talking about where the industry was going and what the Saatchis were doing. And he said, maybe we could do something together. And I said, Alan, I like you. I like BBDO. I have great respect for the work you do, but my heart is set on DDB. And he said, that's interesting. We've also been thinking about DDB. And that sparked the idea, why not have a three-way merger with BBDO standing 
as, as it was, and putting DDB and Needham together to build a new global network, which we had to call DDB Needham. Now we had to keep this secret because two of the three uh, agencies were public, publicly traded. And so we had to keep this secret. So we moved from one hotel room to another, from one hotel to another, because people like your good self were snooping around trying to find out what's going on there. <laughs> uh, so the BBDO came end of April, we had everything figured out. The BBDO board voted early Thursday morning. Yes, good idea. The Needham board, I started a meeting at five o'clock in the evening and we ended at five o'clock in the morning because they weren't so sure about this. I had to show them, first of all, I wanted to call the merged agency burn back, but the uh, Needham people were having none of that. So I had to show them a letterhead uh, that said DDB Needham. And I pointed out that they had seven letters and DDB only had three. So finally we got the approval of the Needham board and then the DDB board meeting after dinner on Friday night. And we had a deadline of midnight Friday. And uh, what's the delay? Why aren't they coming through? I thought we had an agreement. And then we found out that the Saatchi brothers had made a call on DDB, offering them more money than we had offered. But Joe Daly, the tough Irish chairman of the board of DDB, said, the Saatchis have a little more money, but I think Ellen and Keith have a better idea. And that was it. By midnight, we had the deal done. We called the uh, journalists and announced it. They called it the Big Bang, but we had no name. Um, so they called it the Big Bang, and it took us a while to get a name. I only half jokingly said, why don't we call it Aardvark? Because we're going to be publicly listed, and if we have double A's, we'll be at the top of the stock listing every morning. Uh, but uh, nobody was buying that. And so a month or so later, Alan Rosenstein came up with Omnicom. And that was, that was it. Now, after it was announced, or actually before it was announced, we had to contact clients of every one of the three agencies over a weekend so that we would know whether they were going to join us or whether they were going to split. And uh, we had tote boards and uh, we had uh, our assistants up there saying, OK, Campbell Soup, yes, Heinz, maybe. And after the weekend was finished, we knew we had something and we announced it. So I think it was April 26th or something. I remember it was 86, 1986. Where do you think that love of advertising started for you and that love of the creative product? Well, um, pretty early. I grew up in a, a very small farming community in the middle of the United States in the state of Indiana. I was a small uh, Mennonite uh, community, actually. Uh, television was just coming on the scene. There might have been three sets in my hometown. But the town fathers, especially my grandfather, said, television is the instrument of the devil and you will not watch television. So I couldn't watch television. Radio was okay, provided he vetted the programs. And uh, I, I loved hearing the jingles uh, on the radio and the advertisements in, in Bern, Indiana, Nobody knew about advertising. Advertising was something you did to place an ad in the local newspaper to sell your car or your cow. But as an industry, as a profession, and uh, then uh, my father died uh, when I was very young, and my widowed mother was a, a clerk in a very small grocery store. It was the only grocery store in town. It was very small, but um, the big advertisers would send their promotional material into the store to hang up and be displayed for General Mills and Mars Candy, Kraft Foods, Campbell Soup. But there was no room in this tiny store to display these materials. So I would take them home and study them. And I was fascinated by who writes 
so much milk in a milky way you can almost hear it move who does that and and the images and the and the characters the green giant and and betty crocker was my first pinup girl but i i said that seems fascinating and i developed uh, a real passion not having any idea how to get into this industry or what it was uh, probably and we got into sophomore in high school, the, the local school. There was a lot of music, but art was not something you did. I mean, artists were strange people who lived in garrets. And so there was no art training or education in the local school. But one teacher uh, who was an English teacher, but also was a good artist, and she took me under her wing. And so I decided I would become a commercial artist, an advertising artist. And uh, in my sophomore year, a kid from Detroit moved into our town, and he was a year older, and he had a driver's license. And one weekend, he said, uh, let's go visit my aunt and uncle in Detroit. And on a Saturday morning, he took me to his uncle's art studio, high in the Fisher Building, and there he was creating an ad for Cadillac cars. And I said, that's what I got to do. I have to do that. So I never wavered from that. It took a long time to get, get into the industry, but I, I, really, I really felt like it would be so great to be working with people who did stuff like that and to learn from them and then maybe to do something like that. So it was an early passion. You know, if advertising hadn't existed, what would you have done? I said, I don't know. Maybe I would have invented it because where else can you find a, a profession where you're working with the spoken word, the sung word, the printed word, all kinds of graphics moving and still, photography, cinematography, and the ologies, psychology, and, uh, and, and, and media. And where else can you do this in, with some of the brightest, most fun people in the world? I don't think you can find another profession that has all those things coming together. I'm so still excited about it. <laughs> so true. And some of those ads that you tore out of papers were, of course, from Bill Burnback, but also some were from our first copy chief being Phyllis Robinson. And you were lucky enough to meet Bill a few times, but actually you told me that a lot of what you were able to learn about him was from your beautiful relationship with Phyllis Robinson, who I know has inspired you in many ways. Uh, I'd love to learn more about Phyllis and what she taught you. Well, she taught me a lot, um, but uh, there were other people who had worked closely with Bill who also uh, helped me uh, get to know him. Uh, Bob Gage and Bob Levinson, Bob Cooperman, uh, the great uh, Helmut Krohn. But Phyllis, really, I, I had known her before we came up with this idea, but I couldn't tell her about it. And when we finally told her about it, she thought, hmm, this, this could work. Phyllis was, you know, she hired young women, creative people, who did amazing work. And her work, her advice to them was do the kind of work no one else is doing. I thought that was great. And when she was interviewing candidates, she always wanted to see first ads or commercial storyboards that had been rejected. She wanted to see what this person was really like, and maybe she wouldn't have rejected it. Um, she believed, she said that Bill wasn't really out to make a fortune or to even become famous. Bill wanted to set up a company where they didn't have to send their copy through bureaucratic layers of non-created people. And he, his whole passion was for this free and open environment, the society. And he said once, uh, rules are prisons. And Phyllis kept saying, when I said, well, what was it about that culture, about that environment that really created this, this inspiration for all of you? She said it was freedom. We, we, the shackles were off because she had worked at Gray 
uh, along with Bill before they set up DDB. The shackles were off. We were free to pursue anything we wanted. And I had noticed that freedom in other in some studies was a key a key characteristic of any organization that wanted to be innovative. So the idea of freedom was so important to her and she showed me how it worked day to day, how these women came up with stuff like Orbax, the cat in the hat. I found out about Joan and uh, you don't have to be Jewish to love Levy's Jewish rye. Um, freedom to do stuff like that. Paula Green, uh, we try harder for uh, Avis. And so uh, Phyllis was very helpful in making this merger work. Uh, it took a long time to actually make it work, but that's another story. But she and Bob Gage said, we'll do the launch ads for DDB Needham. And, uh, and they did, and they were great. And their, their line was, uh, the new creative force. And uh, in the, one of the launch ads, they had uh, quotes from Bill Burnback and quotes from Paul Harper to show that this was really a match that, that could work. So, and then Phyllis stayed around and helped me uh, for several years, really, till we got this thing really up and running. She, her copy, she was against Flash and tricks. Uh, she said, let's write the way people talk. So uh, for Clairol, it lets me be me. And uh, really, we're number two, so we try harder. That's the way people talk. And uh, she had this great uh, eye and ear for the people, which was one of Bill's great strengths too. She also, some people said, okay, what do I do when I really get a copy block? And there are many, well, I'm, I'm really blocked. I can't think of anything. Her idea was sit down and write. <laughs> That's how you do it. And 90% of what you do might be worthless, but that 10% could be a gem. But she really focused so much on freedom that I decided maybe we could institutionalize that idea in a way so that all the offices around the world would know that freedom is to be present in their offices. And so we wrote uh, four freedoms. One was freedom to fail, freedom from fear, freedom from chaos, and freedom to be. And uh, that was our way of taking uh, Phyllis's insight about the importance of freedom and trying to make it universal. Yeah. And there are four freedoms still today, which is amazing that her legacy continues to live on in that way, in, in the way of freedom, which what I hear is what she was all about, which is really incredible that the yeah. four freedoms are still our, our driving mantras. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Now, something I learned about you is that you are the father of seven children, which is incredible, but also you are the father to McDonald's Hamburglar, <laughs> a character that you came up uh, with the in, in the 70s, so maybe eight children you have. How exactly did Hamburglar come to be? Well, in 1970, we were one of uh, five agencies invited to pitch for the McDonald's national account. And Ray Kroc, the founder of McDonald's, said, we want a national campaign, even though we don't have McDonald's restaurants uh, across the country. We want people to get so excited about McDonald's restaurants that when we finally build one there, they will rush to it and, have, and form long queues to get into our, our store. Uh, they, they came up with um, 10 questions for each of the agencies. Um, Three of them dropped out uh, pretty quickly, and it was uh, finally up to us and uh, another agency, which I, I won't name. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I will, but anyway. Um, <laughs> we were told, you may not do any creative. You may not present any creative. 
um, just answer these questions. And two of the questions were assigned to me. One was, do we have a unique selling proposition that is so strong it should be our USP exclusively? And the second one was, uh, what would you do or suggest um, with respect to Ronald McDonald? And the other agency, foolishly, <laughs> They had some research the same as we did that Ronald needed a little strengthening. Mm. So they, they suggested that Ronald be retired. But the inventor of Ronald, the father of Ronald, was on the selection committee. And we reasoned that that was not a good <laughs> recommendation to make. Let's say that we will strengthen Ronald. So anyway, we went to business and now we got to figure out, okay, how are we going to do this? Strengthen Ronald McDonald. I decided to go see Chuck Jones uh, in Hollywood. Chuck Jones invented the, the Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote. And uh, I made a date with Chuck Jones in Hollywood and I went to see him and we spent a wonderful afternoon. And he said, well, first of all, Ronald's too perfect. You gotta find, create some imperfections, but also he needs a nemesis. Mm. And that will help him be strong, maybe even a hero. So what, what could be a nemesis? And I went back to the team and we thought of pirates and aliens and all kinds of stuff. But for some reason, it never occurred to us until, you know, the creative process first is information gathering. That's the first step. And then the second step is trying to put stuff together that you've put in your brain. And then the third step is to drop it, just go for a walk, take a shower. In my case, I went home and went to sleep. <laughs> but all these things are going on in my mind and at four o'clock in the morning, burger, sounds like burglar, ham burglar. And that's how it was born. I waited till six o'clock and called my art director partner, Rudy Dockerman. I said, Rudy, I think I've got it, ham burglar. He said, that's it. And on the train and the way of the agency, he did a few sketches and we said, this is the nemesis that will make Ronald Strong the Hamburglar. And then, of course, the team builds on the idea. That's the fifth step. And so they said, well, maybe we have a whole society. Maybe if we have a burglar here and Ronald, maybe Ronald needs some help. How about a cop, an Irish cop named Big Matt? Well, that's <laughs> maybe we need a mayor, a mayor. How about the Big Cheese? And it turned out to be McCheese. So that, that one little moment, aha moment, uh, created a whole society which of creatures which turned into line of clothing and playground equipment and a whole bunch of other stuff for, for many years. Who's the McFriendliest fellow it seems? Who's the best you ever to be? Hamburger, take the wheel! Ronald, Ronald McDonald. So that's how the Hamburglar came to be. <laughs> Such a great story. And I think there's many stories of your impact on the McDonald's business. Another one, uh, another piece of work that is very famous that you came up with as a copywriter is the 1971 campaign, You Deserve a Break Today, which was actually named Jingle of the Century by Ad Age, quite wow. an accolade. <laughs> but like many ideas, I heard that this also almost didn't happen. So tell me about how You Deserve a Break Today came to be. Well, you know, the... A creative idea can be the result of inspiration or frustration or desperation. <laughs> and, and you deserve a break today turned out to be the product of sheer desperation. Uh, as I said, we were not allowed to present any creative in the pitch to McDonald's. And we told them, and uh, I'll never forget the, the slide change I had, USP unique selling proposition, flip, unique selling personality, we said. Bill used to talk about personalities for brands. We will give McDonald's an overriding personality. 
an umbrella under which we can sell many aspects of McDonald's, many selling propositions, and had the creative team do selling propositions because we weren't allowed to write copy. So they were white typewriter type on black boards. Here's a selling proposition. We papered a wall with selling propositions. <laughs> they were created. So we win the business, and now we got to deliver on our promise. And it, it became clear from research that what McDonald's was offering was an experience. Uh, one of our planners came up with that insight, and it was it was absolutely true. And even Ray Kroc, the founder of McDonald's, said people can probably make a better hamburger in their backyard, but they can't have this experience. This was 1970 when eating out was going to a drive-in where a, a gum-chewing ho car hop in a dirty driveway came up and leaned into your window and asked what you wanted. And Ray Kroc had a fetish for cleanliness in his stores. But it was the experience. No one else can offer your favorite food in a clean, pleasant setting, friendly people serving it to you for a low cost. That's the experience. So our idea was, <laughs> um, it's an island. If you looked at the nightscape of one of the big American cities, you saw these golden arches. They looked like little islands. So our idea was, McDonald's Islands of Pleasure. No, islands, come to the McDonald's Island. And you can write the rest. I mean, the islands are, uh, you know, they're, the, the natives are friendly, the food is wonderful on the islands. So come to the McDonald's Island. We, we wrote a jingle, come to the McDonald's Islands, and uh, went uh, sold it to McDonald's, and they said, yes, this is exactly right. And Fred Turner, the president, called the Wall Street Journal and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to up my guidance for you because I've just seen the best advertising campaign I've ever seen. Come to the McDonald's Islands. <laughs> he didn't tell them what it was, but he had seen it and loved it. So we're in uh, day two of shooting in Hollywood, and I get a phone call from McDonald's Legal saying, sorry, but you can't use the word islands in your campaign. <laughs> what? There's a chain of root beer stands somewhere in Nebraska or Idaho, I can't remember where, that refers to their stores as islands of pleasure. Mm. So it's too close. And we told Fred, they told Fred Turner, he says, let's buy the damn root beer chain. <laughs> I want to do this campaign. But that turned out not to be uh, feasible. So now we're stuck with some footage but we didn't have a campaign. And uh, so I booked myself from uh, Hollywood to New York City, and I made a date with two uh, people in the music industry that I really respected. One was Joe Brooks, the late Joe Brooks, who wrote some of the great Pepsi anthems. And the other was uh, Sid Woolishan, who, with his partner, had done a, a Pan Am anthem that I thought was inspiring. Pan Am makes the going great, with, with the singers levitating as they, as they sang, Pan Am makes the going great. So first, first I went to see Joe Brooks, and Joe uh, stuttered. He was a singer, but when he sang, he didn't stutter. But when he talked, he stuttered. And I told him what my dilemma was. I have sort of a campaign. It's about an experience, and we want to get people to get up and get away to McDonald's. But I, I need a, a big tune, and I need a line, and whatever. And he said, well, if this, this conversation go, goes any further, it's $50,000. Okay, well, it's very nice to see you, Joe. <laughs> and I went to see Sid Wallace. And, and he said, well, what, what do you have? I said, well, we want people to get up and get away to McDonald's. We can't tell them to get up and get away to the islands, but get up and get away to McDonald's. And we started playing with some lyrics and some tunes. And he came up with a tune, like a show tune, and it was really good. Ba -ba -ba -da -da, ba -ba -ba -da -da -da. And so we started writing to that tune. And the first lyric we actually wrote was about Ray's fetish with cleanliness. Grab a bucket and mop, scrub the bottom and top. There is nothing so clean as my burger machine. And at the end, we said, we're so near yet far away, so get up and get away to McDonald's. 
makes sense, right? It's the island again. So we're very near in terms of geography, but very far away in terms of the psyche. So we uh, wrote those lyrics, presented them to McDonald's, and they said, wow, we love the feeling of this. What do they say at the end? Well, they say, we're so near yet far away. So get up and get it. Oh, we don't like that. <laughs> so now we have sold a campaign, but we need words for seven notes. <laughs> we got to fill those. And we go back into uh, research and women were using the word break. You know, I need a break from dinner planning. And, and, and dads once in a while would say, you know, give me a break from high prices, whatever. Mm. And, and we reasoned that kids would also like a break from broccoli and table manners. And so it was now, let's do break. So where does break fit on those seven notes? And we kept typing out different alternatives. And finally, you deserve a break today. That's it. So I called Sid and he says, I said, I got it. He said, well, sing it to me. I said, you deserve a break today. He said, it's not singable. I said, Sid, either, either you sing it or I get somebody else to sing it. I <laughs> have a sale. And he did, and he did it brilliantly. So uh, we were able to use some of the footage we uh, had shot. Uh, and then we wrote the anthemic uh, lyric for the sort of the main song, so much life to be lived, so much to be tried. When you share it, you get a special feeling inside. It's a full-time thing, kind of life that you lead. A little break from it all is the break that you need. You deserve a break today, so get up and get away. And then finally we dropped, so get up and get away to McDonald's. In part because we went from 60s to 30s. Another reason, <laughs> one, one woman said she was gonna sue McDonald's because her babysitter listened to the McDonald's commercial you get up, get up, so get up and get away, and took the little girl to McDonald's. <laughs> Grab a bucket and mop. Scrub the bottom and top. There is nothing so clean as my burger machine. With a broom and a brush, clean it up for the rush. Before you open the door, what a shine on the floor When we finish one then Start all over again Tell me what does it mean At McDonald's it's clean You know, we, we wrote dozens and dozens of lyrics for each thing. So it, an original tune, but always freshened with whatever the subject was. Uh, I, I thought a good example of brand integrity and keeping, keeping the core, but changing and keeping it fresh. So then we fast forward 10 years, and this is a story we often hear, and it can be a hard story to hear as an agency. You've done amazing work but we were going to lose the account, right, 10 years later. And I believe you got a call that the relationship was coming to an end. Uh, and I imagine that was a tough call. But then what I love about this story is you spent the next 15 years trying to win back that account. And in researching this, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal quoting your wife about how people had thought you were going a bit nuts because <laughs> you were so obsessed with winning back that account. So tell me about that journey and why it was so important to you to have that persistence. Well, it, part, part of it was purely emotional. Uh, we we didn't deserve to be fired. Uh, and, and Madison Avenue was actually shocked when the news came out that we would be dismissed. And uh, the marketing director's reasoning over the phone that Sunday morning 
when my wife and I were entertaining another client for the weekend, we had General Mills there. <laughs> it was also one of my daughter's first birthday and I had a candle ready to look. Uh, we were great for McDonald's adolescents, but now they were big and they needed someone with more scope and resources. So I said, you know, this is, this is not right. That was my driving uh, motivation, that it just simply wasn't fair, it wasn't right. And also, I said, it's McDonald's who fell out of love with us, we did not fall out of love with them. And part of it was practical, which is not usually told as part of this story. McDonald's was our biggest client in Germany at that time, and we had a substantial amount of their business in Hong Kong, and we were not dismissed from either of those markets. But our, our reputation for McDonald's was so, was so good that the CEO of another fast, fast food chain called me within weeks and said, we, we, we're thinking about giving you our business with no pitch if you consider taking it. And I said, I, I can't consider taking it because we're loyal to McDonald's and we're going to be back with McDonald's. He said, well, I don't think so. Won't you come and ride in my plane and at least come and see our restaurants? And I said, yes, I'm happy to ride in your plane and sample some of your foods, but we are not going to be your advertising agency. He and I became friends. He became head of another client. Anyway, um, so uh, now it's Sunday morning. Now I've got uh, several hundred people that have to be told Monday morning what's going to be in the press. And I called them all together. I got as many as I could in one room so that they'd have to be all huddled together. And I said, okay, uh, here's what happened. McDonald's is moving their business to another agency. What every one of you must do is for the next 90 days, do the best work you've ever done for them because our contract had 90 days to go. And none of you are going to lose your job. Now I knew that if we didn't replace the business in three months, some people were going to have to lose their job. But I figured we were going to be able to replace that business in three months and nobody would have to, but really give them the best work they've ever seen. And for now, Here's a crisp $100 bill for each of you. Take the rest of the day off and go treat your wife to dinner or whatever. I called Fred Turner, who was the CEO of McDonald's, and he, he picked up the phone and he said, I'm sorry, Keith, but you know, the marketing people, I have to finally yield to, to their judgment. I've, I've given them the job, they, I have to. I said, I'm not calling to complain, Fred. I'm just calling to alert you that you have overnight <laughs> gone from our biggest, most important client to our biggest, most important new business prospect. And we are going to, Paul Harper had given me a, uh, an award for best new business record uh, when I was head of the Chicago office. And it was a cannon, it was a, a 30 inch cannon, a real cannon. And I mounted it on a stand and aimed it at the Leo Burnett building <laughs> and told them that we were coming after them. And I can't believe this is so corny, but it seems celebratory at the time. About half a dozen of us, we had a jingle that we were using in a local market, and it was really a good jingle. I've got a taste for McDonald's, you know, by the smile on my face. And we all got together and marched over to the Burnett building and sang this, I've got a taste for McDonald's. It took a while, um, but, um, we kept feeding them ideas. Uh, John Bradstock, one of the great, great people, management partners I had from uh, Australia, and he had such a passion for McDonald's too. And so we would cook up these ideas and say, we know we're not your agency anymore, but we were thinking about this promotion or that promotion. And after, and we were relentless. And we kept uh, letting Burnett know that the cannon was aimed squarely at them. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't 15 years, it was probably, I don't know, maybe 10, 
when uh, the marketing director who had fired us said, if you could come to Chicago, uh, buy a dinner. And uh, he said, there's, you know, we're getting so big, there's some promotional activity that maybe you guys could take on because you know our business so well. And I said, of course we will. And then finally, in 1997, they put the whole account up for review. And I said, okay, now we had, the agency had had chances before, but we didn't prevail. I said, this time, if we fail, it's on me because I am moving from New York to Chicago and I'm going to live there all summer long and I am going to make sure <laughs> that we, <laughs> we do our best and win this account. And we had a great team put together and uh, I had Spike Lee come along for the pitch and we had, but I knew, we actually put the whole presentation on tape so we could watch it. And by the time we got up to start making the pitch, we were so confident. And we had window washers. We were on the 40th floor of the building. We had window washers with the new theme on paper roll and a radio signal. They descended outside the conference room and unrolled the new theme. It was wow. amazing. <laughs> and uh, they told us later that 20 minutes into the pitch, they knew we, we had it. It took them a long, longer time to finally get around to awarding it. But that was, that was what we did. We never gave up. We kept thinking about their business. Fred kept, Turner kept giving us little assignments here and there to keep us interested. And uh, I was proud of the persistence paid off. Mm. Such a great story for all our new business leads out there on persistence. And even if you do lose a client uh, and it does take 10 years and 20 minutes, you can get them back. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. And as long as you keep caring about them and caring about their business and identifying some problems that maybe they hadn't thought of and say, you know what, have you ever thought of doing this? And finally, they're saying, you, you guys are really serious. Well, you're not making a dime on our account, except a little bit in Germany. But anyway, that's the story. And yeah, my wife did think I was nuts. Other people did too. <laughs> Maybe I was. <laughs> I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I did it. Good. I love that story. And I'd like to know more about what you're proud of. I mean, I've already touched on all your accolades on McDonald's and being named in the Hall of Fame and different awards you've won over the years for your impact on the industry. But what else stands out when you look back at your career of major moments that you were really proud of? Well, the, uh, winning the uh, Anheuser-Busch business, um, we didn't have a chance and uh, we finally got August Bush to give us a, uh, a brand that he wanted to go from a low price to premium price. And we, we did an amazing campaign um, for B Bush Beer. It had been called Bush Bavarian, and we changed the name to Bush Beer. And one of my first contributions was uh, one of our executives said, what do you do with a name like Bush? And I pulled a tab, Bush. And that became one of their things. But the thing I was most proud of is the work we did for that brand. And then they gave us another brand. But the big brand, Budweiser, was not ours. And one day, I got a call from August Bush. And he said, could you come to St. Louis and meet with me? I'd like to have a conversation with you. I said, well, uh, I'm scheduled, I'm on my way to China, but I can stop by St. Louis and I'm certainly willing to do that. And I walk in, he had his daughter with him. It was too foggy for him to fly to the headquarters. So we were at the hangar in the airport. And he said, in two weeks, I want you to tell me how you would handle the entire Budweiser brand. He said, so you go off to China and do whatever you have to do there. And then in two weeks, let's get together and you will show me how you can handle all of our business. 
And uh, again, great help from a lot of wonderful people, team effort. But uh, he called afterwards and said, okay, you got it. And that led to so much great work uh, done by so many uh, of our creative people. But, but he, he trusted us. And he said about the other agency, he said, I don't trust them anymore. They formed a media company. And in that media company, they put one of our competitors. And I won't stand for that. And he said, I've learned that I can trust you guys. So that was, that was one. There, there are some others, but the great, the, my, my greatest, the thing I'm proudest of is putting together two agencies to form DDB worldwide. I mean, mergers are hell. And, and there are, there's us versus them. And well, that's not the way we do it here. And that's not the way they do it or, and it's, it's this for a while. Mm -hmm. and, and figuring out how to bring this tremendous creative force together um, was an experience. I mean, it took really from 86 to 89 before we were really off the ground. And that was a result of attracting some really great advertising leaders around the world. And we had, but we had an idea that was intriguing to them. We said, we, we are going to create a network of leaders and we will be the opposite of Ogilvy. And David and I agreed on some things and disagreed on a lot. And he and Bill disagreed on a lot. I said, David Ogilvy says, I, David, am the Pope of advertising and I have studied every aspect of communications and here are the rules mm. for how long a headline should be, for whether you should ever use a celebrity. So you go to Sao Paulo and you go to Sydney and you go to San Francisco and you follow my rules. And we said, no, that's wrong. Mm. Porter asked me at our uh, launch press conference, and she thought she had a gotcha question for me. She said, uh, oh, and Mr. Reinhardt, who will then be the next Burnback? Hoping that I would say, well, I guess that would be me. And uh, no way could I be that. I said, there will be a hundred Burnbacks. They will have different names, but they will embrace Bill's insights on creativity and humanity, and they will, they will deploy these resources to the benefit of clients in their market, in media that works for them. And that's how we will create a network of leaders. And we told them, rules are for people that don't know what to do. Our people are leaders, they know what to do. And we attracted people like Nissan Guanes in Brazil, Pietro Tramontan in Holland, uh, Frank Palmer in Canada. Uh, and, and when we let, these people, we said, we're not telling you what to do. You've, you've said that you embrace Burnback's philosophies. You show us what you do. We're, you're attractive to us because of what you're doing. We're not gonna tell you what to do. And we had metrics. They had to be uh, either in the top three of creative ranking in their market. If they were in top three, when, when are they gonna get to number one? Um, they had to be doing the best work in every category they serve. And they had to, and this was key, be the place where the most creative people would kill to work for. Mm -hmm. And so we'd go around and check and see how they were doing on the metrics, but there were no rules. And that grew into something that worked. We also said for 10 years or so, the company, the mother company has to be DDB Needham for now. But you don't have to have Needham on your name. You can have your local name. Mm. So in Brazil, you can be DM9 DDB. And in Holland, you can be Result DDB. And in Canada, you can be Palmer Jarvis. And in Spain, you can be Tandem DDB. And that worked pretty well because it gave them local equity plus global equity. So mm. we did some things wrong. We made some mistakes. But putting that together 
to the point where in 1997, Ad Age said, first ever network of the year. And one of the reasons they gave was what seemed to them like a creative culture. And that's what we were all about, creating a culture. And culture is everything. Peter Drucker, the great management guru, guru said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Culture can't be copied. Strategy can be copied. Culture can't be copied. And so we had symbols and beliefs and we had the four freedoms and we had burn back and uh, what we believe and how we behave. That's how we created a culture. But great brands in my experience have a point of view out of which flows a promise, could be implicit or explicit. And then those two are wrapped in a personality. And we said, our point of view is creativity is the most powerful force in business. Our promise is that we will mobilize all our creative resources to unleash the potential of your brands. And our personality will be passionate, creative, and lots of fun to be with. So those were some of the cultural elements. But that to me, I think is, I had so many great people helping me, but putting that together was the thing I'm actually most proud of. Yeah, I love so much of what you've said, Keith, because it really is my experience today as an employee, you know, so much of what uh, the foundations of this business were are still evident today. You know, we're focused on our culture, our people, on the freedom to fail and on breaking the rules. So that leads us to the second part of this video series. We've covered off the past and now I really want to get your viewpoint on the future and modern day DDB. So in the second episode of DDB Talks with Keith, you'll be hearing more from him on where the industry is heading and his hopes and dreams for the DDB network. So tune in and we'll see you soon.